89.3%. The percentage of Angolans living on less than $3.85 a day, $37.5 billion. The average amount Angola has generated from oil every year since 2011, 8.7 million. The number of carrots that Angola produced last year as the world's sixth largest diamond producer. One, the number of presidents Angola had from 1979 to 2017. One, where the former president's daughter ranks on the list of richest women in Africa. Something in Angola simply does not add up. In this video, we're not only going to get to the bottom of it, but we will try to quantify or at least give a sense of what Angola could have been if it were not exploited and looted by a small group of rapacious oligarchs for almost 40 years. <laughs> Corruption in Angola has been a pervasive issue for decades, impeding the nation's progress and development. According to Transparency International's Corruption Perceptions Index, Angola consistently ranks among the most corrupt countries in the world. From 2000 to 2009, it had an average score of 1.9 out of 10 on the index, with 10 being the best. This means that it ranked 175th out of 186 countries. Some dispute the objectivity of the Corruption Perceptions Index, with its name being inherent to that critique. But in the case of Angola, this perception is certainly a reality. The two most infamous individuals associated with corruption in Angola are former president Jose Eduardo dos Santos and his daughter Isabel dos Santos. It is estimated that during his 38-year tenure, President dos Santos siphoned off billions of dollars from the national treasury for personal gain. Surrounding the Dos Santoses were a group of associates and about a hundred families that made up an oligarchy colloquially known as the Futungo, a reference to the old presidential palace in the small, super-wealthy enclave they inhabit called Futungo de Belas, located in the capital Luanda, which is one of the world's most expensive cities, consistently ranking ahead of Zurich, Singapore, and Tokyo but surrounded by a population where 51% live in extreme poverty. According to estimates by Global Financial Integrity, Angola lost a staggering $77 billion to illicit financial outflows between 2004 and 2013. In one span from 2009 to 2013, the International Monetary Fund found that $32 billion had gone missing. This is roughly equivalent to Angola's GDP during that time. An entire year's worth of economic activity had been stolen. Meanwhile, Isabel dos Santos's personal fortune was estimated to have eclipsed $3.5 billion, which she claims was all the product of hard work and ingenuity. So how did the Dos Santoses and the Futungo pull off this 38-year-long heist? Who was involved? Where was the international community in all of this? Where did the money go? In order to understand all of this, let's do a quick recap of how the Dos Santos regime came to power. Like many countries during the Cold War, Angola was the center of a proxy war between the Western pro-capitalist bloc led by the United States and the Eastern Communist bloc led by the Soviet Union. The faction in Angola backed by the Communist bloc was the MPLA, the People's Movement for the Liberation of Angola, whose opposition was the Western-backed UNITA, the National Union for the Total Independence of Angola. The two fought a bloody civil war, of which the MPLA emerged the victor and took power over the country. Within the ranks of the MPLA was Jose Eduardo dos Santos, known by his compatriots as Comrade Number One, who fought as a guerrilla fighter and went on to hold multiple major political and diplomatic posts within the party, including coordinator of foreign affairs. 
and eventually first prime minister. A luta continua e a vitória é certa. When the first president of Angola and head of the MPLA, Agostinho Neto died in September of 1979, the party elected Dos Santos as president, who wasted no time in consolidating power and turning the country into a dictatorship. When the MPLA dropped its Marxist garb at the beginning of the 1990s, the ruling elite enthusiastically converted to crony capitalism. Ricardo Soares de Oliveira, Professor of International Politics of Africa at Oxford University. The primary cash cow for the regime was oil. Sonangol was the national oil company but it was used as a sort of slush fund for the Futungo oligarchy. The appointed head of Sonangol from 1999 until 2012 was Manuel Vicente. To his credit, crude oil production under his watch tripled, and Angola was making almost $34 billion a year from it by 2011. However, it was during his tenure that the $32 billion went missing, most of which was found by the IMF to have been attributed to off-the-book spending by Sonangol, and 4.2 billion went totally unaccounted for. In another instance, Sonangol and Vicente loaned $85 million to the husband of the president's daughter, who never paid it back. In any properly functioning country, these sorts of actions would be grounds for dismissal and prosecution. But in Dos Santos's Angola, this was a job well done that earned him a promotion. Manuel Vicente was given a special post as a national economic coordinator and then became vice president of Angola. As best as we can trace, every major Angolan investment held by Isabel dos Santos stems either from taking a chunk of a company that wants to do business in the country or from a stroke of the president's pen that cut her into the action. Kerry A. Dolan and Rafael Marquez, Forbes magazine. Isabel Dos Santos studied engineering at King's College in London, and her father wasn't going to let her talents go to waste. In 1999, Jose Dos Santos set up the Angola Selling Corp with an exclusive license to market Angolan diamonds and gave a 24.5% stake in the company to Isabel Dos Santos and her mother, Tatiana Kukanova. Just one year later, the Dos Santos government issued a massive telecommunications license, which was one of the country's first, to a company called Unitel, which was founded and owned by Isabel. Of course, she claims her winning the bid was because she had one of the most daring and aggressive proposals. Unitel would go on to make 460 million in loans in just one year, to a shell company called Unitel International Holdings, owned by Isabel. In 2013, Isabel had the idea of doing an urban renewal project in the oceanside town of Areia Branca, which was a low-income fishing village inhabited by about 3,000 families. Though others had the same idea and made proposals, her father gave the contract to Isabel. She claimed that the project would use advanced dredging and reclaim land from the sea, and therefore no evictions or demolitions would be necessary. Before dawn on a Saturday in June of 2013, presidential guards, soldiers, police officers, and bulldozers descended on the town. The place was leveled, and everyone was immediately evicted. There was nothing. No warning, no notice. Nothing recalled Talitha Miguel, a 41-year-old school teacher. It was as if it were a massacre. The residents moved to a neighborhood a few hundred meters away, where they complain of their homes being flooded routinely by ocean waters. Isabel would go on to use these cash cows to fund her massive business empire. She bought significant shares in two Portuguese banks, Banco BIC and Banco BPI, a communications group called Zon Multimedia, and its affiliate Zap, a satellite TV service, 
Angola's largest cement company, Nova Simangola, and hundreds of millions in real estate holdings. In 2016, Isabel was appointed as head of Sonangol, the national oil company, again through the edict of her father. During her time there, more than $81 million was sent offshore to companies that she owned. In 2010, Dos Santos and her husband, Sindica Docolo, purchased a Swiss luxury jeweler called De Grisogono via two companies incorporated in Malta. But of course, their partner on the deal was Angola's diamond trading agency, Sodiam, which also co-owned the two Maltan companies. On top of that, Sodium would loan a total of $120 million to De Grisogono over its lifetime. Many experts say there is strong reason to believe that the company was used as a front to funnel diamonds out of the country for years. With these multi-carat concessions in hand, Princess Isabel was able to live out her dreams of hobnobbing with socialites and celebrities and living a life of extreme luxury, all on the tab of the Angolan people, of whom one out of every two were living in extreme poverty. That didn't matter to Isabel and Docolo, though, because they had to focus on spending the loot. They bought a $55 million apartment in Monte Carlo, overlooking the Mediterranean Sea, and a $35 million yacht to explore it. Isabel bought multiple properties in London worth around 18 million pounds, not too far away from Manuel Vicente, who owns two luxury apartments next to the iconic luxury goods retailer Harrods. Isabel and Docolo purchased a penthouse in Lisbon for 2.5 million and spent $50,000 on the curtains alone. They then bought another penthouse on the same floor for $2.3 million. They couldn't pass up a good deal. This is just a list of a few of the things they bought to reward themselves for their hard work and service to their nation. The full list is extensive and hard to trace because of their usage of shell companies, of which they own 94 in total. In 2012, American oil and gas company Cobalt Energy made a large finding in West Angola. The Angolan government made a stipulation that there needed to be local ownership, or in other words, the Futungo needed a slice of the pie. Two local companies, Nazaki Oil and Gas and Alper Oil, would have 30 and 10% shares respectively. 20% went to San Angol, and the remaining 40% went to Cobalt. It was later found that Nazaki and Alper were owned by Manuel Vicente, Leopoldino Fragoso do Nascimento, a.k.a. Dino, a former general who was also given interests in telecoms and other oil concessions, and General Manuel Helder Vieira, a.k.a. Copelipa, a man so powerful some call him O Chefe do Boss, the boss of the boss, who owned interests in oil, diamonds, and almost every lucrative sector in the country. When U.S. authorities started to press cobalt about its Angolan operations, the Dos Santos regime decided to shuffle the cards a bit. Sonangol purchased Nazaki and Alper's stakes in the deal for $1.3 billion, 14 times what Nazaki and Alper would have spent on development expenses. The regime wasn't interested in fairness, transparency, or cleaning up. They knew they could rearrange the chairs and continue to slush the oil money around as long as everyone was happy with their share. Despite their knowledge of the corruption and nepotism involved and mounting pressure from U.S. authorities, Cobalt completed the massive deal. In the end, no one faced any consequences. Cobalt was just one of many foreign companies that were happy to share the spoils with the Angolan oligarchs. Total, the French oil giant, was one of the primary developers and exporters of Angolan oil. Sonagol made a joint venture company called China Sonangol with the China Hong Kong based Queensway Group, which is run by a Chinese businessman named Sam Pa. This group has shares in more than a dozen oil concessions, as well as a share of the country's richest diamond mine. The Dos Santos regime routinely used PricewaterhouseCoopers to do audits of its various companies. 
and somehow, they never found anything wrong. One former PwC accountant, Mario Leite da Silva, even joined Isabel's financial management firm, Fidequity, as its financial chief, managed all of their Portuguese businesses, and was a board member of the luxury jeweler, de Grisogono. They also employed McKinsey and Boston Consulting, two powerhouse firms known for their keen attention to detail and astute business sense. And rather conveniently for them, they never found anything wrong either. The oligarchs had accounts and received loans from banks like Citigroup, Banco Santander, ING, and Intertrust of the Netherlands. The banks only stopped dealing with them when the new government of Angola began to prosecute. News about their dealings was being published in the international press, and Interpol issued a red notice, essentially an arrest warrant, for Isabel dos Santos. It can be argued that if Western financial, accounting and auditing firms had done their proper due diligence and acted with moral responsibility, they may have been able to stop or at least limit the looting of Angola. Unfortunately, they did the exact opposite and chose to enable the corruption. This is a common element of the story of African corruption that often goes on without scrutiny. What should have been used for health care, schools, roads and social services in Angola was deposited in England, Portugal, Malta, Spain, the British Virgin Islands, Switzerland, the United States, and any other Western country with institutions that were willing to look the other way while the Angolan heist was ongoing. The consequences of this rampant corruption in Angola are staggering. Today, a third of Angolans lack access to limited standard drinking water. 54% have no access to standard sanitation. 53% have no access to electricity. And an unfathomable 89% of the country lives on less than $3.85 a day. In a country that produces one out of every 50 barrels of oil pumped and is the world's sixth largest producer of diamonds. What country could Angola have become if the Dos Santos regime had not had its way? We wanted to try to get an answer to this question, so we did a bit of quantitative analysis. Of course, no one can predict what an alternate reality would have been. But we decided on a method we thought would give the best picture. We wanted to see what Angola's economic and human development indicators would have been, if the level of corruption had been just average, rather than extreme. So, we took the scores from Transparency International's Corruption Perceptions Index from 2000 to 2009, and averaged the scores for the 187 countries on the list. Angola had an average score of 1.9 out of 10. We then took four countries, whose average scores were closest to 5 out of 10, to get our list of geographically diverse comparison countries with average levels of corruption, which were Cape Verde, Hungary, Jordan, and Malaysia. Here are some of the key takeaways from our analysis, and for a deeper dive into all of the numbers, we added a link to the full data set in the description, which we encourage you to check out. The comparison countries had an average extreme poverty level, those living on less than $1.90 a day, of just 0.63%. The highest among them was Cape Verde, which is also an African country, with just 2% extreme poverty. Angola's rate is 51.1%. Angola's adult literacy rate is 66%. The comparison countries average 93%. Despite the wealth of oil and diamonds, Angola's GDP per capita is just $6,974, and the average for the comparison countries is $23,850. The United Nations Human Development Index is used to measure a country's living standards, health care, and education levels on a scale of 0 to 100. The countries with average corruption levels had an average index score of 75, this is on par with nations like Qatar, Ireland, and Barbados. Angola's score is just 58, 
a 23% difference in human development. It should also be noted that Angola has more natural resource wealth than any of the comparison countries. In fact, it has more than all of them combined. The Dos Santoses and the Futungo may lie, but the numbers simply do not. Angola would likely be richer, more educated, and more developed if it hadn't been robbed blind. The mismanagement of funds and lack of transparency have also deterred foreign investment, crippling Angola's economy further. The World Bank reports that, due to corruption, the country faces significant challenges in attracting investors, limiting job opportunities, and stifling innovation. The Angola that could have been, a nation untainted by corruption, could have witnessed a brighter future. Funds that were embezzled by corrupt officials could have been allocated to education, empowering the youth with knowledge and skills to drive Angola forward. The healthcare system could have been strengthened to provide adequate medical services to all citizens, reducing the country's high mortality rates. Investments in infrastructure could have transformed Angola into a regional hub for commerce, boosting employment and attracting foreign businesses. On a positive note, the current government of Angola is prosecuting Isabel and multiple members of the Futungo for their crimes, and many of their assets and accounts in Angola and in other parts of the world have been frozen. Though there is a standing Interpol red notice for Isabel's arrest, she seems to be somewhat comfortably enjoying life in Dubai. One can only hope that the Emiratis comply with Interpol for the common good. As we wrap up this episode, it is crucial to recognize the urgent need for systemic change, transparency, and accountability in global finance and trade. Only through persistent efforts and the collective commitment of all stakeholders, including citizens, civil society organizations, financial institutions, and governments, can corruption be eradicated. It is our hope that one day we can witness the birth of a new Angola, where the opportunities outweigh the costs and the nation can truly flourish. Thank you for watching, and as always, please leave your thoughts and comments below. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more thought-provoking content. Together, let's strive for a world free from corruption.